so let's get started, please. Uh, hello, uh, this is uh, Vijihi Batuman. Uh, I am the Senior Executive Vice Chair of the Deming Department of Medicine. I want to welcome you all to, uh, to today's Grand Rounds. This is our first after the Corona pandemic uh, reached our city. Our format is different today. Instead of a single presentation, we will have four short talks on different aspects of COVID by four of our distinguished members of faculty. I'm hoping that the speakers will stick to their time limit so we can hear all of them. Our speakers in the uh, order of uh, presentation will be Dr. David Mushat. Uh, he's an associate professor of medicine and chief division of infectious diseases. He will present us overview of COVID-19, followed by Dr. John Dwyer, assistant professor of medicine, uh, faculty in division of infectious diseases. He's a medical director of the antibiotic stewardship program at Tulane Medical Center and also the co-chair of infection control at Tulane Medical Center and associate director of Tulane School of Medicine Biosafety Clinic. His presentation will be COVID-19 infection and control. Followed by Dr. Robert Gary, who is a professor of uh, Department of Microbiology and Immunology, Assistant Dean Graduate Program in Biomedical Sciences, Program Manager, Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium, and also the Director of Tulane Center of Excellence Global Viral Network. He will, his talk will be Proximal Origins of SARS-CoV-2. A paper he published on this in Nature has already uh, been accessed over 1.4 million times. Our last speaker is Dr. Darlene Fusco. She is a member of the Division of Infectious Diseases, Assistant Professor of Medicine. Uh, her interest is in host factors that mediate interferon antiviral response using in vitro and in vivo models for dengue and uh, Zika virus. Her talk will be SARS-CoV-2 research in progress. Without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. David Mushat, who in many ways reminds me of uh, Dr. Rio in uh, Camus' uh, novel, and it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mushat. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great to have you. Um, hang on, it's gonna be a, a rocky ride here. It's gonna be fast, I've got a lot to cover. Um, but thank you all for joining us today, and I'm going to go ahead and give you a brief overview of the more the epi and the clinical aspects of COVID-19. I've got nothing to disclose, but bear in mind that virtually all the drugs and treatments in this lecture are either being used off-label or unapproved by the FDA. So this is the data from Louisiana as of uh, noon yesterday. It's probably being updated right now. Um, we had about 1,400 cases reported, 46 deaths, so that's a uh, uh, case fatality rate roughly of about 3.3 percent. Bear in mind, however, this will change uh, ultimately when the true number of uh, infections is determined serologically and the true number of deaths is ascertained. Um, Seven or 8,000 tests have been performed, the majority by commercial labs, but many are almost 2,000 by the state lab. You can see on this um, uh, scatter uh, diagram map here, you can see where the cases are. They started mostly in the Orleans Parish and Jefferson Parish areas, spreading uh, uh, towards the uh, Baton Rouge area. Central Louisiana was spared for a brief time, but now they're starting to see an uptake. And of course, Northern Louisiana is also having an uptake, an increase. This is the Johns Hopkins website, which is a great way to view the, uh, the international data. You can see that uh, as of uh, last night, Nearly half a million cases have been confirmed, 18,000 deaths. The U.S. is now number two behind China at about 54,000 cases. And if you look in the right lower corner here, you can see the exponential increase in, in, in daily cases. Okay, so starting with uh, uh, the clinical aspects of uh, COVID-19, um, we still believe that the uh, incubation period ranges from about two to 14 days with a median or average of about five or six days. The, Classic or typical symptoms are fever or cough or shortness of breath or any combination of those. But in addition, it may very well present as a, a viral or flu-like illness with myalgias, sore throat, and headache. And more recently, uh, we're seeing reports of um, increased um, 
um, uh, presentations of nausea, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, and anorexia. And finally, the most recent findings uh, from our ENT colleagues are um, observations of patients complaining of anosmia or, or difficulty taste, uh, smelling and uh, dysgeusia, difficulties um, tasting. So what are clues to the diagnosis of COVID-19? Obviously your test isn't gonna come back immediately. So you need to be able to ferret out the patients that are likely to have this. And the kind of classic findings on lab analysis are gonna be lymphopenia, not everybody. And this can be a, a progressive lymphopenia can presage uh, worsening. Transaminitis and typically a normal procalcitonin. In addition, other markers that we see are elevated LDH, ferritin, and D-dimer, and these also may have prognostic value. The radiology in many ways is quite classic, but there's tremendous heterogeneity as well. This uh, CT shows the kind of classic purple multifocal opacities. It's been a lot of attention on the ground glass opacities, as you see right here, but you can also have consolidations. You can have both, but they do have, tend to have this sort of multifocal peripheral distribution on chest X-ray and especially on CT scan. I love this graph. This is, uh, I believe, uh, being published today by Siddiqui and colleagues from the Brigham and Women's in Boston. Um, it, it, it's probably not perfect. It, it, you know, it, it still has to be uh, fine-tuned. But it's a great way of looking at a viral illness such as COVID-19 and the um, stages of the viral um, damage followed by the host inflammatory response. So on the x-axis is time and the y-axis is severity of illness. We can think of this disease as having essentially three stages, early infection when there's a high viral load. We then move into a, a, a second stage, a pulmonary phase, virus may be going down, and then you start to get into the hyperinflammatory phase where you have um, increased a host inflammatory response, which can be uh, sometimes can be maladaptive and can actually create cytokine storm, uh, increasing uh, complications. Under these phases, you can see the types of symptoms. In this first stage, patients often have mild constitutional symptoms, dry cough, diarrhea, headache. Um, as it progresses, they start to get hypoxemia. Uh, and then um, the, in the third stage, this is what we see, adult respiratory distress syndrome, shock, uh, myocarditis, cardiac failure, et cetera. And we have a number of markers, including IL-6 and other inflammatory markers that tend to go up. Troponin may go up as well due to the involvement of the heart. Down below, there's a very nice guesstimate as to when the different types of drugs uh, should be used and or may be effective. On the top, you have these sort of antiviral interventions, remdesivir, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and convalescent plasma could be useful throughout. Um, reducing immunosuppression, those who are on immunosuppression early may be important. And then at some point, uh, immunomodulators, perhaps steroids, um, IL-6 inhibitors, et cetera, may play a role in preventing progression in the more advanced stages. This is the clinical spectrum or pyramid of surveillance that we, we use when we look at, at diseases. And this data, of course, will be updated. It's, it's, uh, but it, for, for right now, it gives you a pretty good sense of the fact that about 80% of cases we think are mild, 14% severe, and 5% are critical. Um, to compare this virus at the top with others, um, you can see that SARS had a case fatality of about 10%, MERS about 35%. Influenza typically is less than or equal to 0.1%. Spanish flu in 1918 was at least 2.5% uh, case fatality and probably uh, uh, in some set settings up to 20%. We think that the case fatality for this virus is somewhere in the one to 3% range. This is some data from China. We don't quite have this data yet for the US, but it shows the um, underlying health conditions or comorbidities that are seen in patients with COVID-19 and that correlate with um, more severe outcomes. Most commonly cardiovascular disease, followed by diabetes, uh, chronic lung disease, hypertension, and cancer. This is the most recent data from the MMWR on March uh, 18th, showing the first data on the um, um, severity of illness in the United States. At the top, you can see uh, the uh, blue shows the increasing incidence of ICU admissions in these patients as uh, one ages. You also see the increased mortality. In the table at the bottom, it's a little bit easier to see the gradation of the, um, uh, the increasing risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, and case fatality, you know, with um, case fatality as high as 10 to 27% in people 85 and older. So clearly age is important, but so are comorbidities. So what about treatment? Uh, remdesivir is, a, is an antiviral. 
that was used in the Washington State patient that was um, um, at, that was uh, 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 discussed early on, and this patient did improve within 24 hours. However, one patient was not a clinical trial make, and obviously uh, ongoing studies are addressing this, and Dr. Pusco will talk to you more about it. There's been some hope that HIV protease inhibitors uh, may be effective, as well as other agents such as interferon alpha and ribavirin. This is the first uh, study, a uh, randomized study of uh, lopinavir ritonavir, the initial uh, uh, one of the early uh, drugs for HIV. It was published on the 18th. And unfortunately, what you can see here is that there was no difference between the treatment group and the control group in terms of time to clinical improvement in the intention to treat population. And similarly, um, there was no difference in the um, decline in viral load over 14 to 20 days, 21 days between the treatment and control group. This is a very hot item right now. This is the study from DDA Raoul's group in Marseille, France, uh, looking at hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. Um, it has been published. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, it does seem to show some, some um, effect of hydroxychloroquine with or without um, azithromycin. The green line at the bottom shows the percentage of patients with PCR positive samples. And you can see that, it, that that line goes down much faster in days 4 and 5 than those who receive hydroxychloroquine alone and those who receive controls. Or, or rather, yes, controls. And this table shows you um, the actual um, patients with virological cure. So in red here, you can see that in the control group at uh, day six post-inclusion, 12, 13% uh, had virologic cure, 57% in the hydroxychloroquine only, and 100% in the combination arm. However, notice a very small N, it's only six out of six. And to quote one uh, distinguished um, commentator, um, there are holes in this data that are large enough to drive a truck through. So we need much better data and we, we need to be cautious. Um, and just to review some for the clinicians, some of the toxicities using these agents, obviously QTC prolongation is, is worrisome with these, particularly when they're combined. So daily EKGs may be warranted. Hypoglycemia can be seen due to the effect of hydroxychloroquine on the pancreas altered sensorium, and don't forget the drug-drug interactions. Hydroxychloroquine is an inhibitor of the CYP2D6 uh, enzyme, and this may increase levels of metoprolol, carbidolol, and tramadol. Treatment. So remdesivir is a novel nucleotide analog prodrug. It was uh, looked at a number of years ago for Ebola and was not effective. Um, data here uh, in this uh, particular article from Nature Communications in this uh, upper left graph shows, um, you know, highly um, active, um, uh, significant activity in terms of the um, in, in percent inhibition at relatively low levels. So this looks promising. Dr. Pusco will tell you more about clinical trials. This is an example of the algorithms that we're using here in New Orleans at some of our hospitals. Uh, much of this has been adapted from other places such as the Massachusetts General and Boston Consortium, um, the VA uh, uh, system uh, and University of Washington and others. You can see that we stratify by severity if patients are not terribly sick and have no risk factors such as diabetes, lung disease, that we may not give them any treatment. Once you start adding in risk factors and severity, that's when you start to up the ante and consider adding hydroxychloroquine and then later perhaps antivirals. I think the million dollar question with this disease is the timing of these interventions. It may be that some things that we're giving later should be given earlier and things that we're giving early should be given later. That's the really that's the real conundrum here. Now at the bottom is a nice table um, that comes uh, originally from the University Medical Center, who LSUID, 2NID, Oxner, Turo, and others have gotten together to come up with some recommendations for broad spectrum antibiotics in these patients, because obviously the clinical picture can mimic uh, bacterial sepsis and pneumonia. Cautions, avoid NSAIDs. There's evidence that they can upregulate the ACE2 receptor that the virus attaches to. In terms of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, it's the same mechanism essentially. There's no need to stop them in people who come in with COVID who are on them, but you should avoid starting them in these patients. Let's flatten the curve. And that simply means mitigation. You try to reduce cases, severity, spread, all these things. We want to try to flatten the curve so that fewer patients are getting sick, fewer people are requiring um, healthcare, fewer patients are requiring ventilators, et cetera, so that we can stay under the capacity of the healthcare system. 
mitigation strategies. I'm not going to belabor these. I think everybody knows they're really essential if we're going to beat this, and we will. Social distancing, hand washing, um, you know, staying at, working from home via all sorts of platforms. This is what we need to do. Um, it's extremely important. Bright spots. Um, the good news is that the first um, vaccine went into phase one trial last week in Seattle, Washington, under the auspices of the NIH. It's a messenger RNA vaccine um, that encodes for a form of the spike protein, and they hope to have um, these 45 participants um, uh, enrolled in the next uh, month or two. There's perhaps a possibility that phase two may be available perhaps in the fall, uh, particularly for healthcare workers. Another exciting um, uh, option may be the use of convalescent plasma. The FDA has just uh, um, uh, sent out a, uh, uh, or made an FDA emergency IND, um, which does allow um, providers to attempt to uh, provide this modality. It is indicated for severe or immediately life-threatening infection. The donors must have confirmed infection. They must have had resolution of symptoms for at least 14 days prior to donation, and they must have a negative um, PCR test. And I believe that um, Darlene Fusco, Arnold Drouin, her husband, um, and Tim Peterson and others here at Tulane at the Blood Center are working to uh, make this a reality. Um, I, I highly recommend that clinicians take a look at these wonderful podcasts. The first one is a, a nice discussion by um, a uh, expert on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in, in combination with or without azithromycin and a very nice brief nine minute discussion uh, about the concerns surrounding ibuprofen and the uh, ACE inhibitors, and this is on the JAMA network. Thanks to all the brave clinicians, nurses, staff, researchers, students, and volunteers who are working so tirelessly to defeat this pandemic. Um, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate the, the groundswell of, of volunteerism and support, you know, medical students who can't see patients. It's just extraordinary. We have, we have been overwhelmed with the, um, uh, the interest and enthusiasm uh, and thank you, everybody. So I will finish this by saying roll away. Thank you, Dr. Mushet. Thank you for your tireless work. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Dwyer, uh, who will uh, present COVID-19 infection and control. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? We can hear you. And okay, see you. great. You can see my scene, great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Dwyer. I'll be speaking to you about infection prevention and control considerations in these uncertain times of COVID-19. Are my slides moving? Uh -oh. Let's see, sorry. Okay, so I have no disclosures. <clears throat> Here's what I'd like to talk about today. I'd like to talk about transmissions, the, the knowns and unknowns. Um, I'd like to discuss asymptomatic carriers, how we're working to protect our healthcare workers, recognize and discuss the fact that we have finite amounts of personal protective equipment, known as PPE, and what strategies we're, we're working on to optimize our supply of PPE. So concerning transmission, I think it's important to remember what we do know and what we know of other coronaviruses from, from the, the four that circulate regularly here and, and MERS and SARS-CoV-1 is that they're spread primarily by a droplet. And droplet are large particles of respiratory fluid. They're typically 10 to the one to 10 to the two micrometers. Um, and this is the main driver of transmission. This has been endorsed by the CDC, the WHO. And these respiratory droplets are caused by coughing or sneezing, and these coughs and sneeze and respiratory droplets can land on surfaces which we touch and then touch our face or touch our nose or mouth. Um, these droplets can land on the person you're speaking with, on their face, on, in their mouth, in their eye. They can, the CDC even goes on to say that perhaps if someone's close enough, these respiratory droplets can be inhaled, which can cause possibly disease. WHO kind of uh, hinges their bets on that. They don't really mention that from what I found, but the CDC does put that on their website. It's important to remember that the sick people are the most contagious people. Um, we do have belief that there's asymptomatic spreaders out there, and I'm gonna discuss that in a, in, a, in a little bit. And please remember that this is spread by contaminated surfaces, which we'll talk about. You can see in the top right corner, there's been elevator buttons, which have been implicated, laptops, cell phones, doorknobs. We touch these contaminated surfaces. 
we have growing data that these the the droplets can remain viable on these surfaces and then without washing our hands we touch our face or touch someone else and spread spread the virus in that way so talk a little bit about asymptomatic carriers there is there is growing data out there many case reports and papers which i've listed on the right which are quite interesting um, COVID-19 can present as an asymptomatic carrier state. It can present as acute respiratory disease and pneumonia. There have been several documented cases and cluster outbreaks caused by asymptomatic carriers. Based on my reading, we don't quite know if, this, if people are asymptomatic from, for the entire duration of their infection, but we do know that people during their incubation period can become, can start to shed the virus, and also convalescing patients can shed the virus. So that, that's a little tricky because th there could be people out there that, and most likely are, who are either asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic or have, were symptomatic and now have recovered who are still spreading the virus. So what about possible airborne transmission? I feel like I'm maybe opening up Pandora's box here a little bit. This has been a, a hot topic. Um, I've had many interesting discussions. There's, there's many articles written about this possibility. And I think that based on my reading and my discussion with several of the virologists uh, at, at Tulane is that it's important to recognize that this is a possibility. Airborne transmission of the virus is a possibility and we need, we need to think about it and consider it. And we also need to recognize that we need more data. We need more science experiments. Um, we, we need some hopefully monkey models, which I'll, I'll speak about. And I also believe that it's important to remember what we know and is possible and what, versus what we know is occurring. And coronaviruses historically have been spread by respiratory droplets um, touching the person in front of you or touching a surface, staying on the surface, and then we touch our face. So it's important to remember what we know is occurring and, and distinguish that from what maybe is a possibility. And the WHO says that pretty, pretty directly is that they're reviewing the literature and they'll make recommendations when more literature is presented, but at this point, we, we don't have any solid evidence that it's spread by, by airborne or droplet nuclei. This is a recent paper. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, March 17th, and they looked at the aerosol viability of SARS-CoV-2. And you can see in the, the graph on the left, SARS-CoV-2 is the red or orange shape, and they compared it to SARS-CoV-1. So how they did this was they took a, uh, an aerosol generating machine, um, they aerosolized the virus into a large drum, a large steel drum called a Goldberg drum, which I believe is a 40 gallon drum. And they measured the aerosol viability, I believe every 15, maybe 30 minutes up until three hours. And they found that there was viable virus in the, in the air after three hours. It's also important to recognize that this was done under perfect conditions. It was a machine which was aerosolizing the virus, which doesn't quite imitate a human cough or a sneeze and the drum is, is sealed. There's no inflow or outflow of air. The relative humidity is optimal. So this must be, I believe, interpreted with caution. The surface viability of the virus was, it remains most viable on stainless steel and plastic, and the experimenters tried to use um, substances that are, that are common in healthcare settings. So copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic. And they concluded that it, the surface viability was most stable on plastic and stainless steel and was detected up to 72 hours on these surfaces, although the viral titers decreased over time. And they concluded that aerosol and fomite transmission is plausible, but again, we need more data. This is an interesting article written by one of Tulane's own virologists, Chad Roy, Dr. Chad Roy, and he works at the Primate Center. And this was written in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004, I believe, and it was after one of the SARS-CoV-1 outbreaks at that time where there was a faulty sewage system and the, the virus was aerosolized. This, this is a coronavirus as well. It's spread by a, by a droplet and, and sur contaminated surfaces, but they found that there was a, due to a faulty sewage system, there was people that were infected about 600 feet away. So I think Dr. Roy makes some interesting points is that there's, there's diseases out there that are spread via aerosol transmission and they're obligately spread that way, such as tuberculosis, measles, it prefers to be spread that way, and then there's opportunistic 
viruses, which could be spread that way under the right circumstances. And I believe that, again, this is something that we need to consider, but we need more data as well. And luckily, Dr. Roy is currently researching this at the Primate Center. So we really hope to have some information upcoming. Shifting gears a bit, um, we all know that we need to protect our healthcare workers. I think this is something that's causing quite a bit of, of uncertainty and stress uh, around the country and definitely in New Orleans. Um, unfortunately, healthcare workers, it's a strong possibility that they will get sick. Um, in China, the first 44,000 cases, about 3.8% 3, 3 of them were healthcare workers, thankfully. Um, there were not many deaths, but it is something that we're obviously keeping in mind and trying to protect our healthcare workers. And how do we protect them? We protect them frequently, not frequently, but people on the front line, they need personal protective equipment. And can personal protective equipment run out? And the answer is yes. And these are not tabloid articles. These are some articles from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, ABC, and a newspaper in Seattle. Um, telling stories of what people are doing, making makeshift masks, reusing masks. Um, so it's something that we're working endlessly at, at Tulane Medical Center where I'm directly involved and I'm sure I know the other hospitals around the city as well. And I think it's important also to realize that this COVID-19 pandemic is, is a crisis. It's a legitimate crisis. I don't think anyone feels any differently than I do concerning that. And we need to think of outside the box and think of ways and strategies to prolong our PPE which we are doing. This is a photo of a woman on the right making face shields in Seattle because they had run out of PPE. This is a tweet of, um, a, I believe, an emergency room physician in New York City who, as you can see in the title, I've been wearing this PPE for three days now, the same one. This is where we don't want to end up, which is why we are op trying to optimize our supply and reaching out to vendors and suppliers tirelessly. So some of our experience at Tulane Medical Center and what we've tried to implement for, for PPE optimization, one of the amazing things I think that they've been able to do, we've been able to do, is the entire seventh floor and most of the fifth floor are negative pressure rooms where the air is exchanged at least 12 times per minute, up to 20 sometimes. We have early on limited the entrance of visitors. We are encouraging to limit the number of healthcare workers entering the room. For example, maybe just the attending one day and the resident the next day, um, but the whole team does obviously does not need to go in the room. And I would even advocate to do much of your visit by either by the phone or through the window. Telemedicine would be fantastic. I know some hospitals have robots that can go in there. Um, and even limiting, limiting your time in the room is very important. If you have to enter the room, stand stand greater than six feet away from the patient. We've actually placed blue tape around the beds to to designate the six foot area. We've cohorted COVID-19 positive patients in the same rooms and in the same floors. We are reusing eyewear. We have thousands of reusable plastic eyewears which can be decontaminated. We work to constantly re-educate MDs and RNs concerning PPE and our strategies, which I think is very complicated and very stressful for, for all of us because the recommendations change based on our supply and and based on how our, our healthcare workers are, are functioning in those in those areas, sometimes the thing we things we propose don't just don't work, and we have to we have to adapt. And it's it's a complicated process, but we're we're really working hard to, to protect everyone. We're working with um, the Primate Center in, as far as de how we can decontaminate and reprocess respirators. They've been fantastic, developing strategies to do that. And we are in constant contact with the state and our suppliers in order to, to get more PPE. Um, my last few slides, I, I think that um, this is something I've personally struggled with. And this is, I think this is a time of uncertainty. The, the COVID-19 pandemic is something we've never seen before, perhaps if someone's worked in West Africa with Ebola. But in this country, this is something we, any of us alive, have never dealt with, as far as I know. Um, and I think that that generates some fear, which is understandable. And I, I think that it's also very important to remember what we already do know and to practice what we do know and to practice what we're good at. Um, and I, you, you're welcome that I, that I saved my last slide for hand hygiene, hand hygiene, hand hygiene. But it is very important. We do know that this is spread via contaminated surfaces. So washing the hands is extremely important. Not touching our faces is extremely important. 
stay staying away from each other when when it's possible, especially if someone's showing symptoms. Uh, I don't believe this is a time to perform thorough physical exams on our patients every day. I think that if the visit can be done by, by standing six feet away, I think it should be done. I think that proper doffing and donning of personal protective equipment is extremely important. Please remember that doffing is is a, is a time when one can contaminate oneself. So decontaminating and, and cleaning your hands between every step of the doffing process is extremely important. Remember to protect your eyes, don't touch your face. Again, wash your hands, decontaminate surfaces around you, especially if you're in the, in the, on the floors or in the wards for extended periods of time. Remember to practice proper cough etiquette. Um, so I, I do believe that during this uncertain time, it's important to remember the things that we are certain about. And then I'd like to just close by saying that we, we recognize that we don't have enough PPE and I think that's causing a lot of stress for, for everyone. Um, so on last Friday, I reached out to Dr. Ledoux and said, Dr. Ledoux, I need some student leaders who can help us work and protect our healthcare workers because we, we, don't, have, we don't have enough. Um, it's frustrating for everyone. You know, we can, the US government can put men on the moon and we can't put face masks on our health, healthcare workers. And I think that's frustrating and scary for everyone. So I reached out to Alexandra Woodbridge and Sophia Foroshani, who are student leaders. And by, that was Friday afternoon morning. And by Friday afternoon, they had contacted over 100 Tulane medical students. They had a list of over 100 corporations and their suppliers in this, in this area with their contact numbers. Um, they had recruited other students. Um, by Saturday, I was in contact with Dr. Callie Linden and Sarah Kostich and Allison Cormier. And we kind of joined forces by Saturday. They also had a, a protocol written with a, a, a letter to petition for supplies and a thank you letter to when we did receive supplies. They designated three drop-off sites. And by Monday morning, we received this from the Cajun Navy um, with, I believe, about 2,095s. And they received another, uh, we're up to about 3,000. These are some of the folks that are participating in this. This is our Gmail, the Gmail account that they created. They have a Facebook page and Instagram page and Latoya Cantrell also posted and shared. So these folks are working tirelessly to, to protect our healthcare workers and I wanna give them a debt of gratitude for their, for their work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dwyer. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Gary, who's a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And uh, he's a director of uh, Tulane Center of Excellence Global Viral Network. He will present to us proximal origins of SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Gary. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna try to share this slide now. Uh, can you see that? So um, I'm going to talk about this paper. I hope everybody can see it on the screen. Can, can you hear it on, see it on the screen? Yes, Dr. Gary. Okay, thank you. So this is, a, this is the paper that we uh, recently published, uh, and uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. I think you can see in the corner there that we've gotten about almost 2 million accesses to the article now. Um, it's on the origin of the SARS coronavirus 2. Um, it turns out uh, that this is one of the most uh, shared uh, papers ever on social media. In fact, uh, according to the site Altmetric, we're number one of over 14 million outputs. So that's really unexpected, but uh, you know, somewhat gratifying that people are interested in our work here. So uh, why did we start this, uh, this uh, pro project to try to figure out where this virus might have come from? Uh, one of the big drivers was, um, of course, the uh, internet, where there were a lot of uh, theories about how uh, this virus could have originated um, and entered into the human population. So there was a major paper about uh, the possibility that snakes were the original source of the coronavirus outbreak in China. This was based on some uh, rather unfortunate analysis of some molecular data. Um, there was another uh, theory uh, widely circulated that um, that China somehow stole the coronavirus from some of my friends actually in Canada and then weaponized it. Um, 
there was a paper that came out uh, on the uh, bioarchive, a uh, preprint server, uh, that claimed that uh, the SARS coronavirus was uh, at least in part uh, derived from uh, the HIV proteins. Uh, that that paper was uh, quickly withdrawn uh, when it turned out not to be a, a credible claim. And there are a number of other things, for example, that the virus was brought to, brought to Earth by a meteorite, meteorite uh, from space. So um, one of the one of the conspiracy theories, though, that is uh, proven to be a little bit more difficult to debunk was the notion that the virus originated from uh, some of the wet markets uh, in in China. And um, this is uh, some serving pictures, unfortunately, I think, but uh, to some people that uh, will show that basically people do capture animals that are in their backyard and sometimes they eat them. Uh, I, there's one slide on here that isn't from China. I'll let the people that are not from Louisiana, uh, you know, guess this. Well, actually, it's this one right here. We do capture things uh, that that uh, are in our backyards and, and prepare them for food. The other uh, coincidence was that um, the one of the major um, sources of some of the original patients was, uh, was one of these wet markets where um, seafood and, and wild animals are sold uh, in the um, Wuhan city in, uh, in China. Uh, the seafood market was located about 20 miles away from the uh, one of the only, in fact, the only biosafety level four lab uh, in China. And so this generated some of the more persistent uh, controversy theories that somehow or other the Wuhan Institute of Virology had released the virus or accidentally uh, uh, unleashed it on its uh, on its population, so this this drove us and, and my collaborators to uh, look at uh, some of the origins, uh, potential origins of the SARS coronavirus too. So the first thing we looked at were um, some of the uh, changes that the virus was undergoing uh, as it moved through the human population. So I'm not going to go into great detail about any of this uh, any of this data today, but just to show you that you know we can look at phylogenetic trees, which are on the left part of this slide, and then we can plot the changes uh, that the virus is undergoing over time, and through some um, sophisticated analyses, uh, one of my uh, co authors on the paper. Uh, Andrew Rambo is a really an expert at looking at this type of data and trying to decide uh, when the virus may have entered the human population. So here's just some of uh, Andrew's analyses um, that uh, look at uh, how fast the virus is evolving. And I can just basically summarize this data by saying that, you know, it is the typical virus. It, it's putting in about um, one base change for every thousand bases uh, every time it replicates. And that's not really unusual at all for a uh, coronavirus or really for any other virus. And we also uh, can use some of this data to estimate when the virus, uh, the actual virus may have entered the population, the human population. And when you do these uh, estimates and you get a, a number that's called the time to the most common most recent common ancestor, or TMRCA, uh, it actually correlates very well with uh, the time that we know the first cases uh, showed up in China. So uh, either uh, late October or December, or, or perhaps even, um, you know, if you look at the conference confidence intervals, uh, you know, uh, the earliest perhaps August. Now this is the actual virus. It doesn't tell you uh, anything about the evolutionary history of the virus. And for that you need, I need to introduce you to a couple of uh, interesting uh, animals. Uh, on the left, the horseshoe bat um, that uh, is uh, prevalent in Asia. And then, um, a little typo there, I apologize for that. The Malayan pangolin, uh, which is uh, probably one of the cutest animals on, on the planet. So um, here's uh, some of the actual data uh, from the paper. And uh, this is uh, where really we started to do the, uh, you know, the serious analysis about where the uh, SARS-CoV uh, could have come from. And it didn't take too long to recognize that there were a couple of unusual features uh, in, in the genome. Uh, the first of these um, that we'll, uh, I'll mention is the uh, receptor binding domain. Uh, now, those of you that follow this closely know that the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus uses a, a protein called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 on the surface of a lot of different cells to bind to and to enter the cells. 
And so uh, when we looked at the part of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome that encodes for the spike protein, that protein that binds to the ACE2, uh, we found uh, some unusual features here. In fact, the, we found that the receptor binding domain, as we call it, uh, was very close to a virus that was found uh, in, the, um, in the Malayan pangolin. And um, so, in fact, it's almost virtually identical, this receptor binding domain in this pangolin virus uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, uh, even though that pangolin virus in the other parts of its genome is, is very different, more further removed. So um, uh, that's, that's one important thing. So the other thing that we found was is that this um, new virus, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, had an unusual feature uh, in its uh, spike protein. And that unusual feature is what we call a polybasic cleavage site. So uh, that is a, a series of arginines uh, in the virus sequence. And uh, if you uh, look closely at the slide and know how to look at these amino acid sequences, you can see that there's actually an insertion into the uh, gene for the um, uh, spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 that puts in uh, four amino acids. And the insertion of the four amino acids actually results in what we call the polybasic cleavage site. Uh, and that site can be recognized by enzymes like furin that can uh, cleave the spike protein. And that's necessary for what we call activating the virus. If you can't cleave the spike protein very efficiently, the virus can't enter cells and fuse with the membranes very well. So why did that cause me to uh, stay up all night one night just worrying about this? Uh, it's because uh, one way to generate a highly pathogenic uh, avian flu virus, another respiratory virus, is to uh, add a polybasic cleavage site. So you can see on the left uh, the, the, uh, the bird there, the chicken, uh, with a low uh, pathogenicity avian influenza virus. It has, um, you know, a pretty pedestrian uh, cleavage site between the two subunits of the, of the surface protein of that virus, which we call the hemagglutinin. On the right uh, part on the, on the slide um, is uh, a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus that, if you look down in the corner there, uh, has the uh, multiple arginines and even some lysines there that make that spike protein cleave very well. And that actually makes the, um, the um, avian influenza virus uh, able to infect humans and to spread to multiple organs, uh, not only in the chicken, but also uh, in a person. So um, we, we uh, identified these fairly unusual features of the SARS-CoV-2 and then um, you know, decided to look a little further at first the, uh, some of the bat viruses uh, that I mentioned, uh, the horseshoe bat, that uh, are actually uh, fairly similar in most of the genome uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, and then uh, how they relate to the SARS-CoV-2. So here's just a summary of some analyses that you can do to see how far back in time uh, that one of these closely related bat viruses might be related to the SARS-CoV-2. And you can do the calculation in a couple, couple different ways, uh, but basically, uh, you know, this virus is probably, a, a similar virus has probably been in, bat, in bats, and it probably took uh, years or, or decades for uh, that virus to evolve something like the SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so what do we know about other coronaviruses which might tell us about the origin of uh, the SARS-CoV-2? Well, there have actually been two other coronaviruses that most people have heard about uh, that uh, have entered the human population. And both of these uh, coronaviruses are actually uh, what we call zoonoses, direct transmissions from human to animals. So the first one is the original SARS, what we might be calling now the SARS classic uh, virus or syndrome. And uh, that was a virus that in the past has probably uh, been in bats, but evolved over, over probably decades to a virus that is now uh, circulating in several different animal species uh, in, in China and in Southeast Asia. One of them is a, a virus that's called the civet. It's a cat-like animal. And basically the civet and some other animals have a virus that is almost, uh, well, not almost, it is identical to uh, the SARS-CoV-1 or the SARS classic virus. And this virus is a zoonosis. It can be transmitted to 
uh, directly from an animal like the civet to humans uh, where there's moderate spread. Now the original SARS, the classic SARS, didn't spread to that many people. There were only about 8,000 cases. And so the virus is not fully adapted to people. It doesn't spread very well. The other uh, virus that um, you may have heard about is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, another coronavirus that is uh, similar to the original SARS in that uh, it is a zoonosis, a direct transmission from animals to humans. In this case, a bat virus many decades ago, perhaps even hundreds of years ago, evolved into a virus that can infect uh, camels very well, camels in the Middle East. And this virus in the camels, the MERS-CoV, can spread directly to humans, where it is, again, basically a dead-end virus. It can spread in people, and you can get small transmission chains, but there's limited human-to-human -human transmission. Now, with the SARS-CoV-2, we think there are a couple of other possibilities. Um, that uh, explain its origins. First of all, you could have selection in the animal host. And again, we don't think it's a direct transfer from a human uh, to an animal. So that makes a difference from the SARS classic and the MERS. Somewhere back in time, probably decades ago, there was a progenitor in a bat that uh, was similar to a virus that probably was able to infect pangolins or some other animal species in China. And as the virus circulated in this intermediate host, it, it probably evolved to you know, infect that host a little better. And eventually, at some point, it may have acquired this furin site in the virus, just like a highly acute or highly pathogenic avian virus. At that point, it may have acquired the ability to infect people efficiently and to spread in people efficiently. And you know, that may have been one possibility for the origin of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2. Another possibility, and this is actually the one I favor, is that there was perhaps cryptic adapted adaptation of the virus in human. So long ago, a bat progenitor virus that got into an intermediate host, a pangolin or some other animal, adapted a little bit more, uh, but not fully to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then it infected people where it spread uh, perhaps for uh, a period of time, maybe years, maybe decades, uh, but undetected because uh, it hadn't yet acquired all the pathogenetic pathogenicity factors. And uh, then if it just had that proper mutation, maybe the acquisition of the furin site, it acquired the ability to spread easily in people. So that's the end of my slideshow. Um, you know, I, I think this is our current thinking of the virus and I'll, I'll now uh, turn it over to Darlene. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Uh, our uh, last speaker is uh, Darlene Fusco, uh, again, Assistant Professor of Medicine in Division of uh, Infectious Diseases. Her talk is SARS-CoV-2, uh, Research in Progress. Can you guys see the slides? Yes. Okay, and, so well, no, We gonna... hear you, but uh, we're not can seeing you hear... the slides. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, and now you can see the slides. Uh, no slides as of yet. You can't see slides? The slides are not showing. Okay. Go there and share the slides. Share again. Here we go. Okay, I'm saying share. Can you see it? Click on it. Click on, it. Click on the green. I'm clicking on the green. Can you see it? We're seeing Dr. Gary's slides. Okay, now okay, here we see now. Now we see your slide. Okay, so basically, what we would like to communicate is that there are three clinical trials. Um, one of them is at University of Minnesota, but two are here. Uh, the first one is ClinSeq here. Please go to slide presentation uh, mode. Click. You're on it. Yeah, I'm on it. Can you not see it? We see your slide uh, now. It's uh, down. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. You can see. It. Okay, so basically. Uh, ClinSeq here is an approved IRB approved clinical uh, study, observational study that uh, is currently approved at Tulane and is in the IRB process over at UMC. It's observational, and we're attempting to collect nasal swabs, serum plasma, and urine. Uh, the the ante for this was just up this morning when we realized FDA has now approved. Um, potential for use of the collected convalescent serum from no longer infectious patients as a therapeutic. So we really want to get recruiting on this uh, ASAP. Gilead um, has 
we're in the final stages of getting Gilead 5, 7, 7, 3, and 7, 4, phase 3 safety efficacy for remdesivir. And then there's a healthcare worker uh, post-exposure prophylaxis clinical trial that I'll, I'll basically share these slides so people can get involved in that if they have been exposed. It's hydroxychloroquine, 50-50 uh, chance hydroxychloroquine versus placebo. So ClinSeq's here. Please, anyone who is in contact with COVID patients, ask them if they would be willing to enroll in this observational minimally minimal risk study. Um, basically, we have a big virus and antibody scientific team who are looking to analyze these studies and get this data out to the community ASAP. A uh, very large uh, study team, but I will point out that the majority of our study team is either uh, sick, working from home, or not able to get Meditech access. So we have a, a pretty small a group that's able to consent the patients, and, and that is currently our rate limiting step. Our goals are to establish a database with donor information. So please, if everyone who's looking at their lists and keeping their lists of all the COVID patients and analyzing them, please participate in this clinical trial so we can do this systematically in an IRB approved fashion um, to really look at the data as a group. Um, everyone is, is looking over their patients, but if we can recruit patients into this, we look at their clinical course, especially the meds given, the ARBs and the ACEs, and try to get real answers to whether those are doing harm or, or, or neutral. Um, sequence, we want to get the viral load, uh, viral load here in-house. We're working to establish that. Dr. Gary's team is working nonstop. And then sequencing, uh, that will be sent out to these labs here. Determine if the virus is dropping with any of these interventions and also determine whether it's evolving. So serum, who's got the best neutralizing antibodies and can we use these as a therapeutic? And again, that urgency has just accelerated based on what the FDA is allowing. So population one and population two are in the study. Population one is sick. So inclusion criteria, just a positive COVID test. And we're actually going to be extending that to people who have a potential history of a positive. There are no exclusion criteria for this minimal risks uh, observational study. Ideally, the patient's hospitalized because then we can pool our PPE and sample most uh, more than one patient at the same, same time using the same PPE. Intervention is a nasal swab, blood collection, but in general, we're just trying to get what's residual in the lab, uh, urine if possible, and then a chart review over the course of a year. Population two is recovered or potentially asymptomatic, but highly exposed, diagnosed more than 14 days ago and recovered. We're trying to set up serum collection up to 550 ml. So this is a real blood donation. And then serum testing for anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, antibody and we'll inform the patient of the result. We have a lot of assays we're going to do with these antibodies, but the, the, the potential for using it uh, in the short term as a therapeutic is, is something we're now actively pursuing with the blood bank and PATH division, which, which we really appreciate. Uh, tons of people working on this right now. Um, so recruitment is difficult. This nasal swab, you know, I went in there the other day and they, they sneeze all over us. So we, we have to be very careful. Um, there are difficulties posed with trying to explain a study to a patient without being face-to-face -face to them, doing this over the phone. So we explain the study, get verbal, uh, verbal consent, and then we go in the room and swab, but it, all the phone calls are time-consuming, and this is the rate-limiting step. So the more people we can get helping us uh, identify patients who are willing to talk to us and then get um, people, study staff, on the phone with them uh, will help. I do want to send out a huge thank you to Dr. Renault, to Manur Hyder, and to Catherine Bolin, who have helped us recruit our first uh, subjects. We have had uh, four swabs, and thank you to Allison Smither and Bob Gary's team who have run the PCRs. Um, we are, healthcare workers are the front line in this, and we, we really need to be grateful to these people. So all COVID teams will be informed of this protocol. Um, if you have questions, and I, I haven't talked to you already, please let me tell you about this study. Um, we're looking for 500 inpatients with active infection, 500 convalescent patients. UMC is adapting the study to actually uh, do randomized um, hydroxychloroquine versus other, so that we can get data faster on whether that's working. So moving into remdesivir, uh, Dave, thankfully, you talked a bit about this, so I'll just jump right in. Basically, we're, we're at the final stages of, um, I think we're, we're actually, we can say that we are now a site. Um, phase three trial, randomized open label multi-center study. Um, uh, compassionate use is gone. This is our only option. Let's skip the science. I'll just point out this review by Eric de Klerk in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery is very good and provides some rationale uh, that, that's helpful for understanding why we are interested in this compound. Um, 
and I'm going to make these slides publicly available if people want just to go further into the rationale for why we want to participate in this study. And I just want to thank everyone who's been helping us working through the weekend nonstop trying to get uh, in this trial. This is a nationwide competition to become a site for this and it looks like we're making it through the final hoops. We really want to have access to this medication because it's looking like it may help. We need a clinical trial to determine whether that's true. Roberta and Cynthia have been working nonstop uh, with our co-eyes, uh, Bojanowski, Denson, Drew, and Luke, and Zadafia, and our whole study team who is working around the clock. I just wanted to point out a, a big thank you to all of them. Um, so th basically, this is two, a two-part study, severe and moderate. So severe definition currently, so severe or moderate patients, so severe definition less than or equal to 94% O2 on room air. Okay, you have to take whatever is on them off so that we can document that. Uh, can they be intubated? An addendum went through yesterday, an amendment went through yesterday. Yes, intubated, uh, no renal failure. We need to see the details on that and we'll circulate that as soon as we get it. Um, looking for 400 participants in this multi-site trial. So we, we want to compete for those spots because, uh, you know, everyone across the country and I think internationally is, is trying to get into that 400. Uh, it's IV 200 day one and then 100 daily for up to five or 10 days. So the severe patients who get into this trial are either, two minutes left, okay, are either getting five days or 10 days. There's no non-treatment. Moderate means uh, greater than 94% O2 on room air. They get randomized one to one to one, uh, five days, 10 days, or standard of care. Standard of care uh, can be anything on our current published treatment protocol, which is generally hydroxychloroquine to start. Inclusion and exclusion criteria, I, I again, want to make these available to everyone. We, we want to study these. We want to be really prepared to know which patient can get into this. One thing really important, the PCR must have been drawn less than or equal to four days before randomization. We need a quick turnaround time for our PCR, of course, which is what we are all working on. So basically, you draw the test and then it is back within three to four days. That's the day you have to randomize the patient. It has to be within four days of that uh, positive PCR test sampling. Uh, these are the other inclusion criteria. Basically, the O2 sat, uh, pulmonary infiltrates, written consent currently, that's under evaluation sort of nationwide. And they have to be off all other anti-CoV-2 uh, agents for less than 24 hours, for 24 hours prior to dosing the drug. The moderates are above 94%. And th these are a really important group because, you know, we, we, the drug may work very well before the patient is very inflamed. So we, ha we have to really work hard to recruit into here. Here it says 18 years, and there's an amendment that just went through for adolescents, 12 to 18. We're working on figuring out how to um, get the ability to consent children on this. Um, and basically, I'll make these available again. Key inclusion criteria, again, it says written consent, PCR confirmation less than four days. Uh, the temperature definition, they have to have a fever. It's, there's actually a few more ways to measure it. O2 sat greater than 94, and then they, they do have to have that chest x-ray showing the pulmonary infiltrates. And then just as you guys have been hearing for compassionate use, um, ALT, ASD greater than 5X, UL, and, and creatinine clearance less than 50 for this one. Those are exclusion criteria. So basically last thing, and then we'll be done. It's basically any healthcare worker who's been exposed. Uh, there's an email here where you can enroll in a randomized clinical trial, 50-50 uh, chance of getting hydroxychloroquine versus uh, placebo, and you take online surveys. Uh, Ryan, Nagy, Cassidy, Werner, and Ashita have uh, kindly uh, established themselves as the contacts if, if you need to be walked through that. It's very uh, stressful to be exposed, and this is something that we can offer the healthcare worker community right now. It is a 50-50 chance, but it, it's something. Um, and again, we'll make, uh, this is the online picture of the survey you would take. We'll make that available to everyone. And um, again, please ingrain in your mind, we have ClinSeq Seer, we have our Remdesivir, and then you have that University of Minnesota. The more people we can get helping with this recruitment, uh, the, the faster we can get answers to some of these questions. Okay, thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Fresco. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna thank uh, Dr. Mushet for putting this program together, and I want to thank our speakers. I know uh, we're a little over, uh, but I'm going to uh, permit uh, another additional 10 minutes for any questions. So if there is any question from the audience, mute yourself and ask your question so we can hear and uh, the appropriate person will try to answer your question.
So I, I have a question for Dr. Mushad, if you can hear me. What is the recommendation for healthcare workers integrating into their families when they go home at the end of a, of a shift in a hospital with COVID patients? Should they self-quarantine? Should they come in and sit at the dinner table with everyone else? What, what is the recommendation at this point for, for healthcare professionals? So uh, can you hear me? Um, that's a great question. So I'm assuming you're talking about somebody who has uh, symptoms and has um, either presumptive or proven uh, COVID. So uh, let me, I'll go ahead and just, and just give you the, the spiel. So basically, if, um, if, if a healthcare worker is sent home and they're suspected of having COVID, um, either uh, based on symptoms or testing, then I think it's prudent to um, you know, follow the um, CDC um, guidance, the home care guidance, um, and basically what you do is you, you know, you um, stay in a separate room. If you come out, you put a surgical mask on, you do frequent hand cleansing, social distancing, hopping into your sleeve, you know, frequent decontamination of surfaces. Um, it's all pretty common sense stuff. Um, I'm actually doing that right now, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm in quarantine, and so I'm staying in a separate room, and I come out for fresh air every now and then. Um, but you know, the key is to lie low. Now, if you are a healthcare worker with an exposure, but not symptoms um, and not proven disease, that's a little bit different. Um, you, you know, you, you can do that, but you don't necessarily have to. I mean, you're, the problem is that there may be some people who after, you know, two, three, four, five, six days, whatever, who have been exposed do get infected and don't have symptoms. That um, you know, if you, if you uh, use uh, um, common sense, I think that this goes a long way um, to protecting um, you and your family. And keep in mind also that you know some people who get think they get infected in the hospital are actually getting infected in their communities. And so we also need to be very careful about social distancing um, in our neighborhoods when we go out walking, etc. <coughs> There, there is a question uh, from the uh, participants uh, who didn't have access to microphone. The question is, uh, how should the uh, patients be treated on outpatient setting? Um, I, I can address that too. That's, that's a great question. I've been getting um, calls from our colleagues in the outpatient setting asking if they can give their patients hydroxychloroquine. Um, this is problematic for a number of reasons. Number one, it's unproven. Number two, um, it will use up pharmacy supplies. And I've been told by our PharmDs that many of the commercial pharmacies have the same sourcing of these kinds of drugs as the hospitals. Um, and that's what I was told yesterday. I, I'm seeing today that the supplies, at least in the University Medical Center and in New Orleans are actually pretty good. Um, so it may be possible to roll that. I, I don't think you know a lot of um, effort has been put in and at this point into protocols for the outpatient setting, I will say that if somebody is an outpatient and they don't need to be admitted, they probably aren't very sick. And so they can often be managed expectantly, um, you know, good hydration, rest, sleep, um, you know, avoiding non steroidals, I'd avoid alcohol, you know, just common sense stuff, do things that are good for your body and your immune system. Um, but the issue of giving hydroxychloric, and we really need more data before we start giving this to everybody. And that's why these studies that Dr. Fusco mentioned are so important. One more question from audience. Uh, could, could I ask a question, uh, Billings here? Um, <clears throat> if, a, if a patient recovers from the infection and still uh, potentially sheds the virus, how long should it be after one recovers before they return to work? Okay, so that's a great question, and that's something that is handled both by the, the um, individual hospital occupational health and infection control departments, as well as by um, Tulane's um, wellness clinic slash occupational health. We want to make sure, certainly in wellness, we, uh, if you're a Tulane employee, we, want, we need to know um, that you've had the exposure, but the hospitals need to know as well. The bottom line is, um, the recommendation is if you uh, had, have infection or had it, and you can return to work if it's been at least seven days um, since the onset of your symptoms, at least 72 hours of no fever and overall improvement in symptomatology. And that's, um, you know, that's 
that's particularly if you have not had um, the test. There are you know, some people that may stay home a little bit longer, um, you know, if they're still having some lingering symptoms. Um, certainly if you go back uh, before 14 days, um, many people recommend that you wear a face mask, a surgical face mask. Um, uh, if you're going to be in the clinical arena, you may want to avoid taking care of immunocompromised compromised patients. Um, again, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. There is, there is some evidence that people can shed virus for longer than seven to 14 days, but it's also quite possible that, it's, that the amount of virus is so small um, that it may not be terribly contagious at that point. But we need more, we will get more data on that in the coming weeks. And I would also add to that, I think that the, the CDC, ideally, if we had more tests, we would test people two times once, they're com once they feel better to document that they're not shedding. But the problem is, is that we don't have enough tests. So we kind of have to do what Dr. Mushat said, which is case by case, wait 72 hours till they're feeling better and after seven days of symptoms. But ideally we would re-swab them 24 hours apart to say that there's no more shedding and then it's safe. But we don't have that testing capacity at this moment, unfortunately. Okay. Uh well, there, is, uh, there are a lot of uh, written questions. Uh, there is not enough time to answer all of them. I'll take one of them. Uh, one, uh, apparently a healthcare worker is asking, is there any uh, uh, project uh, using prophylactic hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, for exposed uh, healthcare workers? Wait. Can chloroquine uh, be used uh, prophylactically? I would uh, just, can, I, can you guys hear me? Yes. I would just encourage every healthcare worker to get onto that University of Minnesota site and, and go through those criteria because if you believe, it, if you've been in the hospital and there's a chance you've been exposed, you probably qualify. It's a, again, it's a 50-50 chance for that. We, we don't have a systematic approach. We, we don't have the ability to provide uh, pre-exposure to everyone. I think. Unfortunately, that would probably raise a lot of questions in the community, who gets it, who doesn't. Um, but, but do at least look at that. Um, and then, yes, people are thinking about that. I think the supply is the question. Okay, I'm sorry, I can, I can see that there, there are a lot of questions, but unfortunately, we're not set uh, up uh, to be able to extend this uh, conference longer. Uh, I would like to thank again, Dr. Uh, Mushat and all the other speakers. Uh, for this wonderful presentation and thank you all for joining in uh, and hope everybody stay safe and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Badman and colleagues. Thank you.